so welcome everybody tonight. Um, and thank you so much for having me back. These are always my favorite talks because I feel like um, sharing with the people I enjoy spending my time with, which are headache patients is always so rewarding for me. And I've learned so much about uh, pain and fortitude and the ability to continue to, you know, grab your life when you can uh, from the people I've worked with. And um, I grew up with headache. My dad was Dr. Seymour Diamond, who was one of the first headache specialists in the country. Um, and he was so passionate about patients. And the good news is I got to catch some of that from him. And um, he passed away, unfortunately, about a year ago a little more than a year ago and we miss him so much. But the fun thing is, I still get to see his patients in the office and they're always willing to share a story with me. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide um, and talk about sort of the explosion of therapies that have become available for our headache patients. Um, and so, you know, coming from 1989 when I first started to do headache and we thought, there was something going on in the brain that it wasn't all about the blood vessels to where we are today and CGRP. So it's very hard to hear about migraine today without hearing about calcitonin gene related peptide or CGRP, which is a neuropeptide. And for those of you who are dorky about science, let me just explain what the difference between a neuropeptide and a neurotransmitter are. So when we think of neurotransmitters, things like dopamine or uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine, when those neurotransmitters are released, think of it as being a thimble, th thimble full of information. When we talk about a, a neuropeptide, it's like a whole big bucket of sand being released. And so um, it's important when you think about that if you're a dork like me, to think about how to manage um, or how we're going to manage CGRP. So when somebody gets a migraine, there's a whole bunch of different physiologic events that occur in the brainstem at the trigeminal nucleus and around that area. Um, and that trigeminal nucleus uh, gives sensation to the face. And right behind that trigeminal nucleus are your upper cervical nerves. So think about the kind of pains you have with migraine um, and, and what might be going on in that area. Last but not least, CGRP is a potent vasodilator. So it makes the blood vessels big and thick and inflamed, but even more importantly, it releases um, uh, transmission of information to upper cortical uh, structures. So it became very important for us to think about how we would block CGRP and if it was even safe to do so, because do we need that vasodilatation? Um, we've also learned in the past several years that there are CGRP receptors scattered in so many different places in your body. Um, CGRP is everywhere, but in the brain in particular, it's very closely involved with inflammation and transmission of pain. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but it's a really good slide to think about. So in the past three years, we have had sort of an explosion of new therapies, medications for uh, both the prevention and the acute treatment of migraine and the focus has all been on CGRP. So when you think about your triptans, the drugs that became available back in 1992, those drugs work at the 5-HT1B, so those are serotonin 1B and 1D receptors. And there are those receptors on the trigeminal nerve and what triptans do is um, again, blocking inflammation they probably do not have that strong thing about sending pain messages or blocking pain messages, um, which we may be able to sort out as we understand the science a little bit better. 
We also know that there are CGRP receptors, not just on the trigeminal nerve, but on the blood vessels that surround the trigeminal nerve and that our monoclonal antibodies, the new therapies, um, uh, Amavig, Ajovi, um, Mgality, and Biapti, all work by blocking CGRP, but they do it mechanistically differently. Amavig is the only one that directly blocks uh, the receptor where CGRP binds. Um, and for Ajovi, for um, Mgality and Viepti, they directly bind that big bucket full of sand of CGRP that I was talking about a little while ago. And if you wanna ask about on a botulinum toxin. Again, there's a theory, although we don't know for sure, but we believe that on a botulinum toxin blocks the release of CGRP. So what happens if you block CGRP release? Well, you don't get all that inflammation or transmission of pain message. What happens if you grab all the CGRP floating around? You don't get that transmission of the pain message. And again, if you don't allow CGRP to bind to the receptor, then you don't get that message. And I think this slide builds one more time so you can click it one more time. Um, and that's where Enrenumab works. Um, so the next group of medications that we got, I'm trying to do this sort of in order, last year were the G-Pants. And I don't know who thinks of the names of these different drugs, but they were called G-Pants. Um, and so originally the first G-Pant that almost made it to market was developed by Merck um, and it worked really well. And it worked so well in the acute trial. So in trials we did to look and see if it would get rid of a migraine when you have it, um, the G-Pants worked really well, but it also looked, go back one more, thank you. But it also looked like that might work preventatively. Go one more back, okay. And so, so um, they did a trial with uh, telcagipant, which was Merck's drug that almost came to market. And what they found was, yes, it did prevent migraine, but it caused liver toxicity. So they went back to the lab, threw out that drug, and they had to find G pants that did not cause liver toxicity. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so these are our four monoclonal antibodies. They all share that they have to be given either subcutaneously or intravenously. Um, and there are four of them. And as I pointed out before, Amavig works a little differently than Ajovi and Galati and Viepti. Viepti is the only one currently, and I will emphasize currently, that's given IV. It's possible we might have some other IV entrants at some point in time. Um, they all have a couple different little things. So Amavig has two different doses. Uh, Jovi, you have the possibility of giving you your shots quarterly. Um, and Galati has a loading dose, the other ones don't. And Viepti has two different doses, a 100 milligram dose and a 300 milligram dose. So they all have some differences in mechanism. They're all fairly clean in terms of side effect. Um, uh, certainly Amavig has a bit more constipation and there is a warning for potential hypertension with Amavig. Um, so if you, if you have hypertension, you might wanna go with one of the other guys. The uh, uh, Ajovi and Mgality tend to have more injection site reactions and Biepti is pretty clean. Next slide. So what are the three questions we get asked the most? Click again. The first is, are they safe? So in this point, to this point, they have been available now. Um, Amovig will be the longest because it came to market first and uh, next month, it will be three years since it came to market. 
The good news is nothing terrible has been revealed about any of these drugs. Um, and again, there's a post-marketing warning now with Amavig with hypertension. Other than that, other things have not lit up. Next slide or next build. Are they different than what we have now? So that's the million dollar question. The question is, does this really improve upon our old preventative therapies? And my feeling is, yes, they do. I, I feel like in general, because they're more target specific, in other words, when you took a beta blocker or a tricyclic antidepressant or a anti-seizure drug, they were all developed for a different reason. And a lot of them had significant side effects for patients. Um, because these are targeted, in my opinion, they seem to be much better tolerated um, than before. And the question is, are they an improvement? I, I believe they are. And I believe as we get more and more data, uh, we'll know that. What is super interesting though, and for people on, on these medications is not everybody who gets one of these medicines can be without their other therapies. Some patients still need to be on, on a botulinum with a monoclonal antibody. Some patients still need to be on antidepressants with a monoclonal antibody. So we, we will discover a lot more in the future the longer we have these medications available. Next slide. So what are their highlights? They all reduce mean monthly migraine days. They all can begin working within a week. My caveat to that is if you're a chronic migraineur and you have more than uh, uh, 28 days of headache per month, the early changes will be more subtle, but they will work. All show meaningful clinical benefit by one month. All of them have 75% responder rates, which in English means um, some patients cut their migraine frequency by 75%. Um, all of them work in patients who have not done well in other therapies. Back one more sec. Um, and the question is, can we convert somebody who's chronic to episodic? I believe we will. Um, I believe I've seen that. Um, and we will see patients who discontinue overusing medication because they're not having headaches all the time. Next slide. Uh, so G pants. Uh, G pants, again, we've heard they're used acutely, but we have two G pants that will be approved most likely in the next year or two for prevention. The first is a Toja pant. Um, and again, these drugs can work. Um, and remigipant, um, which is already on the market as Nurtec, but will probably uh, be approved for prevention as well, which will be very interesting in a new treatment paradigm for all of us. Um, both of these drugs, uh, again, have worked well in clinical trials and have been very effective. Um, Atojapant probably will be out either late, late this year or early next year, I believe. Next slide. Uh, oh, going the wrong way. Next slide. Uh, so let's talk about our acute formulations and combo therapies. Next slide. Um, and these are the ones that are approved and available. Click again, please. Uh, on Zetra, Zembrace, and Tosimra. So all of these are Sumatriptan products. Um, and the great deal about sumatriptan was it's multiple formulations. So in Zetra is a breath powered um, device. Zembrace is a three milligram injection. And last but not least, um, Tosimra is a nasal spray. There will also, next, go back, you're going too fast. Go back, go back. There will also be, go ahead, click, uh, cute trip. Uh, which is, next slide. Sorry, guys, I'm not in charge. Qchaptra, there's a DHE nasal spray with a special propellant, and then DHE nasal spray in a powder will come out. So uh, uh, the Zolmatriptan is interesting because it's a micro needle patch. It's already been submitted to the FDA. 
We have DHE nasal spray in two different formulations. We still use a lot of DHE. The biggest issue with DHE is access, um, but it's very effective for patients who have longer, harder headaches. Next slide. Um, we also have our old Trexamet, which is sumatriptan plus naproxen um, combination, and um, uh, meloxicam and rizotriptan has also been, I believe, submitted to the FDA. And there's also a combination in development of promethazine with sumatriptan. Next slide. Uh, so let's spend a minute just talking about lasmitidan. Lasmitidan uh, or Rayval was approved by the FDA in October of 2019, several months before our unfortunate time with COVID. Um, because it has some cognitive issues with it in terms of sedation and its central penetration, as well as a, a, a warning not to drive within eight hours of treatment, it took a little while with negotiations with the FDA to get this drug to market, even though it was approved. It is a ditan, so it is not a triptan. It works peripherally on 5-HT1F receptors, again, to inhibit CGRP release. It does penetrate centrally, hence the sedation. Um, but works quite well. And I've been super impressed that this is a drug that can is really a good addition in my patient's toolboxes. The negative is that some patients have dizziness with it and do not like it. But for patients who do tolerate it, um, I found it to be uh, really effective. It is a controlled substance, so it has the potential for abuse. Um, and it's important to screen people to make sure uh, that we're not giving it to the wrong patient who might abuse it. Next slide. Um, again, more G-Pants will probably come to market. The first one that came was Ubrojapant or Ubrelvi. Uh, Remijapant or Nurtec came next. Um, they both have good two-hour pain freedom. Uh, Bezejapant has a positive phase two trial, and that is a nasal G-Pant. Um, and the good news is we don't see any vasoconstriction with these drugs. Next slide. Um, this is the two-hour pain freedom for both Ubrojapant, Ubrelvi, and Remijapant, Nurtec. Um, so here's the interesting thing with all these therapies. Uh, one of the things that I think is so important for our patients, for my patients, and I'm sure for all of you who are patients, or have family that are patients, is that everyone needs good tools in their toolbox. So I'm not sure that we won't use triptans anymore. I think they're incredibly effective for some of our patients, but I do believe some people are challenged by the side effects of them. And certainly for older patients like myself, um, we might not wanna be on a vasoconstrictor past a certain point. Uh, due to side effect profile and concerns about coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease. So having all these alternatives available is super important for everybody. Next slide. Uh, again, very safe. We do not see the liver signals with these drugs. There is an interaction with an enzyme that's important in metabolizing medications, which is called cytochrome P3A4. I know they give us such easy things to remember. Um, so you have to be careful with certain antibiotics, usually the antifungal antibiotics. Um, and really their major side effect is nausea. Uh, they don't sedate at all. They're very effective medications um, and incredibly tolerable. Next slide. So let's finish up talking about alternative therapies. I don't even like to call them alternative therapies. I'll say neuromodulation and other options for patients. Next slide. So I think it's really important for us to recognize that other modalities can be effective for patients. And the first one that came out on the market was cephaly, which looks quite different here in the photograph because it's now like a Princess Leia 
thing across the forehead it used to be this more cumbersome headband. Um, and, and they provide external trigeminal stimulation. There's also the TMS, which also provides stimulation. Um, and last but not least, gamma core. Interestingly, both gamma core and TMS have some really good acute trials and even some preventative trials, not just for migraine, but cluster. Unfortunately, both companies kind of went belly up and probably are gonna go through some restructuring. So access to these devices can be quite difficult. Um, the next device is a REN device or remote electrical neuromodulation or Nerevio, Nerevio which I've been quite impressed with. It is uh, a device which stimulates and sends uh, signals to the brainstem to send inhibitory uh, messages to turn off pain signaling. Um, it's worked well. It was recently uh, approved for kids, which is super exciting. Um, they're also combined occipital and supraorbital uh, stimulators in development. And last but not least, the Ally lamp. Now, um, when I first heard about this lamp, I was like, oh, okay, what is this? But it's interesting. It's a very narrow band of light, which is not irritating. Um, it stimulates electrical signals in the eye and brain and can help with sort of a calming uh, sense for patients with migraine, can help some vestibular function, um, as well as I've had patients who really were limited in terms of screen time at work or even watching TV where too much motion in the TV would really uh, cause them problems. And I have been so uh, 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 pleased that this lamp has worked for people. It kind of looks like a little lava lamp um, and it's not super expensive. So, and you don't have to keep replacing the parts. So I found that's been really useful. It was in invented by Rami Burstein, who's at Harvard and Rami is one of those sort of gurus and headache that we have. Next slide. Um, and so uh, how do these different devices work? They work at various different places in the central nervous system and also in the, in the, in the um, brainstem. Um, so there are so many different options available to patients today. The biggest challenge with some of these devices, however, is the cost. And unfortunately, except for Nerevio, um, the cost can be quite prohibitive for patients. Um, and so getting insurance coverage has been a challenge um, and will continue to probably limit the utility of some of these devices if they can't come in at a lower price or get insurers to pay for them. Next slide. I think we're almost at the end. Um, so please um, ask me any questions. I'm available to do that. And um, just remember, and I love that lecture before this one, there's so many different tools we can use to restore functioning and to um, hopefully, even though we suffer from chronic migraine disease that we can find tools that are useful to us. And I love that there are so many choices today. Anyway, thanks for your time. I hope I didn't go over too much. And thank you so much. Any... Yeah, thank Sorry. you so much. We have a few questions for you. Um, we have a few minutes, so let me, let me get right to these questions. Um, so someone asked, if you're allergic to a Jovi, can you take other preventatives? You mean other monoclonals maybe? I guess, yeah. yeah. The answer is yes. Um, I've certainly had patients be allergic to one um, and not another one. Okay. And so, yeah, absolutely you can. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, how long would you recommend continuing with the CGRP before you decide it's not working in the case of if you have chronic migraine? Yeah, so that's a really interesting thing. And I have to plead guilty, like early on when we first had these drugs, I probably switched around way too quickly uh, if patients weren't getting good relief. So what I've learned in the last couple of years is that 
early on with these therapies, the changes might be subtle. It might be, I didn't go to the ER. It might be, I'm using a little less acute medicine. It might be, I've been out of bed a whole bunch more. Um, my acute medicine is working better. Um, and so I look for those subtle changes. And I think that's a dialogue I have to have with my patients to talk about that. I probably will give most of them six months um, but that's also why I don't remove other therapies until I know we're getting a response from a CGRP. Um, and, um, and I think that's really, really important. And it's been hard because insurers, sorry, I go on too long, have sometimes limited patients who need both on a botulinum and um, a monoclonal. The good news is most commercial insurers are now approving it. There's only one major uh, insurer who is not yet, and we're gonna keep hounding them until they do it. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, what are you finding is helpful for, for vestibular migraine? Well, vestibular migraine is super tricky um, because it's not just the migraine itself, but oftentimes the visual stimuli that are so disabling for people. So I really like that LA lamp. I do think it helps people. Um, uh, um, sometimes patients, and I don't know why this is true for some people, venlaxifene or the old effexor in a low dose can be helpful. Um, obviously, um, uh, physical therapy, vestibular therapy is super important, and it's not just visual stimuli, and you have to practice it. I mean, it's very difficult, and sometimes uh, 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 a low dose of clonazepam, uh, benzodiazepam can be somewhat helpful, um, and obviously trying to prevent migraine as much as possible when you have vestibular migraine is the ultimate thing because it can be so disabling and pervasive. Okay, great, thank you. Um, then uh, someone asked if someone, someone uh, said they know you don't recommend ketamine, um, but, but when you don't respond to any CGRPs or other classes, including RAVAL, They've done DHC inpatient three times. Um, and uh, the last two times they felt like they're just getting cocktails to sleep. What would you recommend for them? So ketamine is really interesting. And no, we don't do it at the clinic um, or in our inpatient department, but certainly a lot of my patients have done ketamine and they get it in the ER now or they can get it uh, in other places. Um, I, I I guess my one thing with ketamine is I would love to have some clinical data to hang my hat on so I'd know what I was doing and how often I was doing it. Um, and um, again, I've seen some patients respond incredibly well to it and I've seen other people who will hallucinate and be totally uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Um, so having more information would be really helpful for me. Um, and uh, seeing some outcome data, I think, would be useful. But I agree, you got to look for other. You got to look at other things. You know, ketamine's been used for the last twenty-five years or so uh, in in episodic, or, or I'm sorry, for status migraine. Um, and again, there was a guy named John Claude Cruz in Texas that used it a lot before sort of it became more popular. Um, but just dosing and adequate surveillance to see what would be useful would be something. I would like to see. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we, we appreciate you so much. And, um,